so kind to me. the Lord everyone if we could stand together we want to turn this sanctuary into a prayer room for the next few moments we just had a good session of prayer in the back here with our praise singers and musicians God's gonna do great things here today we come with a spirit of expectancy because we know God can do all things and he does all things well amen so let's create an atmosphere of worship in this sanctuary right now if we could lift our hands and begin to worship him together father we love you and we thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, your, your grace. We thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to be in your house today to assemble ourselves together and worship your holy name. Your name is high and lifted up. You are holy. You are mighty. You are wonderful. You are great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Your name is worthy to be praised. We magnify you, Lord. You are worthy. We glorify your beautiful name from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. The Lord's name is worthy to be praised. We worship you. We love you. We thank you for the revelation of who you are, God. Thank you, Lord, for taking the scales from our eyes and giving us a revelation of your name. Hallelujah. Of the power that is in your name, the peace that is in your name, deliverance that is in your name, the healing that is in your name, the salvation that is in your name. Hallelujah. We worship your name, God. We invite your presence to fill this sanctuary today and receive our worship as we lift our hands and dedicate ourselves to you today in worship, God. Hallelujah. Let your presence fill this place, breaking every yoke of bondage. Let your spirit move. Meet every need in this house, God. Meet every need in this house, God. You know every need. You know everyone that needs comfort. You know everyone that needs healing, God. Let your presence move, God, and do the miraculous in this place today. We glorify your name. We magnify you. We lift you up. We lift you up. We lift you up. We thank you, God. Hallelujah for salvation and deliverance. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for while we were yet sinners, you died for us, God. You shed your own blood, robing yourself in flesh, coming to this earth, God. Hallelujah. And taking the death of the cross. You did it for us, God, and we thank you for it, God. We thank you for that sacrifice, God. Hallelujah. We bring ourselves to you. We assemble ourselves together today to call upon your holy name, the only name that saves, the only name that heals, the only name that can deliver. We worship that beautiful name, that holy name, the name of Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. We give you praise. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised, God. Come on. He's worthy to be praised. Come on. Let's lift him up together. Hallelujah. If you believe he's a savior, if you believe he's a healer, hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him. If you believe he's a way maker, hallelujah. If you believe that when you're baptized in his name that your sins are remitted and washed away, let's give him praise right now. God, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We glorify your name. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. He is worthy of praise. He's worthy of exaltation. Hallelujah. We give you praise, God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be faithful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Hallelujah. One more time before we sing. Let's put our hands together and worship the only God that is worthy of praise. He's the only God. Hallelujah. And his name is Jesus. Come on, let's magnify him together.
Great. 
Somebody make a joyful noise unto the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, If you don't already know it, I want to let you know Jesus is on your side. He is for you. He wants you to make it. He wants you to be successful. He wants you to make it to heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is on your side. He is for you. He wants you to make it. I'll say it three times if I have to. Jesus is on your side. He is for you. He wants you to make it. Hallelujah. He's never done anything against you. Everything he does is for us. Regardless of your need, I promise you this. He wants to meet you today. He wants to take care of you. He wants to meet your every need in this place this morning. Amen. God bless you. Before you're seated, I, I caught you off guard. Before you're seated, turn around. Look at the people around you. We're not shaking hands, but this is not our meet and greet. It's the turn and talk. Go ahead and turn around and say hi to somebody. All right. Tell them you're glad to see them. We are so glad all of you are here today. Amen. God bless you. Once you've done that, you've greeted 10 people, you can be seated. Amen. We are delighted each and every one of you are here this morning. If it's your first or second time, you should have received a first or second time guest card and a gift associated with that. If you haven't received a guest card and it's your first or second time, lift your hand. The ushers will get that to you right now. First time or second time to be with us and you didn't run over here on the right. Keep your hand up just a moment longer, sir, please. All right. And anyone else, first or second time, didn't receive a guest card. All right. Looks like we have everyone taken care of. Amen. Pentecostals, will you help me welcome our guests this morning? All right. Lively crowd. All right. I have one guest card with many names, and it's all one family, I believe, but we're so glad to have from Louisiana, Andrew, Maya, Javier, Eliana, Adrian, can't read that name right there, and Levi. Where are you folks at? Wave your hand at us. There they are right up front. God bless you. We're so glad you're here today. Amen. Thanks for coming to the Pentecostals. All right, and before we, our ushers are coming to wait on you, we have three ways to give here. If you'd like to give by cash or check in the main auditorium, lift your hand. They'll get you an envelope. We also can give by our kiosks in the back, my back right, your left. Also, you can give online using the giving tab at our website. Amen. Before we wait on you for the offering, we have a video announcement. We want to, Sister Patricia, are we ready on the video announcement? Thank you so much. There's Zeke and Kaylin. We're going to start over. Okay. 
I appreciate our media people. This might look easy, but it's not. Hey guys, NYC 2021 registration is now open. If you're looking to register, you can go see Brother Justin Gage or Sister Callie Carey. We, we hope to see you there. NAYC registration is open. Young people, how many of you have been to NAYC? Lift your hand. Huh? How many are excited about going back this next year? Huh? So what the announcement, Brother Sean Wilson, he and I are ready to go. We are young at heart. Amen. What the announcement is saying to you, young people, the NAYC registration is open. And to see Sister Callie Carey. Sister Callie, if any of you don't know who she is, wave your hand at us right now. There she is right there. See Sister Callie, NAYC registration is open. All right, we have another guest card, Jody and Noah Jackson. Where are you folks at? Wave your hand at me real quick. Oops. Upstairs. Oh, Kids Church. All right, well, we're glad they're here. Let's welcome them. All right. A couple of other announcements before we wait on you for the offering. This coming Wednesday night is the relaunch of our small groups. Come on now. It has been... Probably six months since we've had small group meetings. I, for one, am lonely for that fellowship, connecting with our brothers and sisters. Now, you will get a note from your small group leader, an email, letting you know how your group will meet. Some groups are meeting in person. Some groups are still meeting via Zoom. That's perfectly fine. And if you're not part of a small group, if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, meet me in the foyer after service. I'll be back there by the stairs, and we can get you assigned to a small group in your area. At one Wednesday out of the month, starting this Wednesday, we have small groups meeting all over the Houston Metroplex. And chances are there's one near your house. It's a chance to fellowship with like-minded believers. There's food. There's some uh, Bible study. And it's a great time. So that's this coming Wednesday night. If you don't know what group you're a part of or you don't have a group, meet me in the foyer after church. I'll be glad to help you. Also, as you noticed on your way in, our foyer and restrooms are under construction. Uh, folks, I promise you, when this is over, you're going to say, wow, what a difference. So just be, help us if you will keep track of your children. Make sure they don't wander into the uh, taped-off areas. Uh, although we cleaned and taped those off, keep your children out of that area. Wives, keep your husbands out of there from nosing around and all that stuff that guys like to do. Also... Our final announcement, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Zion Music Conference. Yeah. It's always a highlight of the year for us, and as, as per our custom, all of the night services are free of charge. We invite the entire church body to come right on. So the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of October, Zion Music Conference. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. The ushers have brought the baskets forward. They're ready to wait on you for your tithe and offering. Let's lift our offering. Let's lift our hands toward the Lord right now. Lord Jesus, we love you. So very thankful for this chance to be in your presence, to be with your people. We ask you to bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Let's worship as we give.
take this time now to dismiss our young people, those 18 and under. You can be dismissed at this time. Youth service is going on in the youth auditorium. If you don't know where that is, there are ushers in the hallway to direct you, but it's basically straight out these doors and straight down that hallway till you come to the end. So young people, you can be dismissed at this time. Amen. I received another, God bless you folks, you can be seated while our young people are going out. I received another guest card and I want to take time to welcome these folks and what I didn't say earlier is apologize in advance if I get your name wrong. Just wave your hand at us so we can see where you're seated. Chris, Tracy, Mason, uh, Andrew, Clark. I'm not sure if I got all that right. Wave your hand at me if I can see where you're at. No? Oh, over here on the right. God bless you. We're glad you folks are here. Amen. Amen. Well, what a wonderful Sunday we've had already. A great crowd in the 8 a.m. service. That's for our at-risk folks. Great-looking crowd here. Give yourselves a hand. We're glad you folks are here in the auditorium this morning. Thanks for coming to the Pentecostals. Amen. We have been blessed over the last couple of weeks to have some of our own back home. Brother and Sister Bracken over here on the left. Amen. Brother Bracken, why don't you come and testify? We love you. We want to hear from Brother Ryan. We love you guys. Amen. If you don't know this guy, if you don't know this couple, you're missing out on something pretty special because the Brackens are awesome people. Brother Ryan, we love you. We're so glad you're here. Come greet this wonderful congregation. Praise the Lord, everybody. How many of you came to serve the Lord this morning? To give the Lord a little bit of praise, amen? Why don't we just lift his name right now? Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this place. We serve a mighty God, amen? We serve a miracle-working God, amen? It's so awesome because uh, for those of you who don't know, we just moved back here recently. We've been at the Louisville campus, 
and uh, God's doing a mighty work there, and uh, I'm so thankful for that. But uh, God's done some things in our life as well, and uh, God's provided so much. He's, he's provided over $10,000 to us just within two months in order for us to be able to afford a home here. And I can only say that it's just God that allows that to happen. And so I'm so thankful for what he is doing in my life. And, and just because that happened to me, that means it can happen to you too. So if you're in need of a financial miracle or if you're in need of a healing, my God can do that for you. Do you believe it? Do you have faith to believe it? You just have to have a little bit of faith and it can happen for you. Amen. We love you. We're so excited to see you guys again. And uh, I'm looking forward to what's happening in the future. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Praise the Lord. So glad to have the Brackens back home. Amen. Why don't you stand right now? We're going to do something we did earlier in the service, and I want to. We've had several people come in since then. You can go ahead and stand. That's fine. All right. Now, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. You can step out from where you're at. Don't shake hands with anybody. Don't hug their neck. But I want you to greet at least five to ten people that you didn't greet earlier when we did this. Tell folks you're glad to see them. Tell them welcome to the Pentecostal. Go ahead. I'll turn you loose right now. Just turn around and start talking to people. There you go. There is no script. Just go for it. Tell them you're glad to see them. Amen. No, nope, more, 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 more. Much more. Amen. All right. God bless you. Amen. Sister Stennett, would you like to come and testify? Yeah? She has a testimony from the Lord, and God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. Would you like to come up, or would you like me to bring the microphone down there? Okay. church. Um, I don't know if what, uh, a few of you might know that uh, I broke my foot back in uh, April, the first day of church. I was worshiping and I jumped and I heard a pop. Looked down, my foot was deformed. Not only did I broke bones in my foot, my bones from the left dislocated to the right. So it was a major thing. Um, I went to the doctor two weeks later to do my uh, checkup. And he looked at my foot and he said, excellent. And I said, all because of Jesus. Right. Uh, I couldn't drive for a month. I wanted to. But I couldn't, and uh, because I have, uh, I had to stay off my foot for three months because the screws in there and no weight bearing for three months, so I couldn't walk for three months. Um, I'm sorry, but when I think about the goodness of God, I can't help myself but. <laughs> I went back to the doctor um, six weeks later after that. And it was like he looked at my foot and he was so confused. He didn't know what to do with it. God healed my foot. Praise God. Completely. Every time I go, I tell him because of prayer, because of Jesus. Yes, yes. And uh, I looked at him and I burst out in tears. And he said, "Why are you crying?" I said, "Because these are tears of joy. Not because I'm sad. Because it tears of joy. Because I know the God that I serve." Hallelujah. And for those three months that I could not stand or walk on this foot. 
I was worshiping God on this one. And I never stopped coming to church. And I said, devil, only did you know that my worshiping comes from my heart. I use my foot and my feet as tools, but it's from my heart. You cannot take it away from me. You didn't give it to me. At therapy, the therapist told me, you're going to be walking 50% when you just start walking. And then another, um, well, he said three to four weeks you're going to take to walk. And then another three to four weeks to walk completely. When I went to the doctor on July 27, my doctor said, you can walk as you can tolerate the pain. That don't happen. With my type of injury, that don't happen. It takes time. And I'll be walking in the booth. They claim I would be walking in the booth for three more months. I don't have no boot on my foot. That's the type of God we serve. He's a healer. He can heal anything and believe it. He's a healer. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful. Thank you, sis. Praise God. Somebody will celebrate in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, if he did it for her, he can do it for you. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Are you glad to serve a miracle-working God? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's all stand together. Let's welcome our pastor, Pastor McKee. We love you. So glad you're past the Rona. So glad you're here this morning. Let's welcome our pastor. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord to everybody. Isn't the Lord good? Why don't you turn around and give somebody nearby a sign language, I love you. Just let them know that you love them with the love of the Lord. Amen. Good to see everyone in the house of the Lord today. And uh, amen. Just feels good in church. Had a tremendous service at 8 a.m. And uh, it's good to be back here at 10. How many noticed a few changes outside in the foyer? For those that are new, it doesn't always look like that, believe it or not. That's not our style choice. Uh, there, we're in construction right now. A lot has changed since last Sunday. And um, <clears throat> we... Uh, we are in the process of building program. We're getting ready to build over next door. As many of you know, we were in a capital campaign uh, supposed to launch the day that sort of Corona, the lockdown, began. And so, you know, we had to put all that on hold. But you know what? We're back up and moving again. And uh, we're kind of getting everything ready for the next step. And so we need needed more for your space. And... Uh, Wanted to upgrade everything in our foyer. We have a conference coming up. Uh, the foyer area of a church is very important to apostolics. It's where we connect with one another. And so we wanted to, to uh, do our very best to make it a, a place where we could make those connections. And so what you're seeing out there is the result of a lot of hard work. And I want to say to all those that came up the, this past week and helped both during the day and in the evening. Thank you so much for your service and uh, for your ministry. And we have more ministry opportunities this week. Uh, mostly it's for trades, um, uh, sheetrock and plumbing and tile, a lot of those uh, things like that. So if you have any experience in those areas, please see Brother uh, Justin Gage, our youth pastor. And I don't believe he's in here. I believe he's over Oh, they are next door for uh, youth service. That's right. And so uh, just uh, uh, see him after service so you can uh, connect with Brother Oyer or Brother Harris. Uh, Dr. Wilson, he was our executive pastor. He's out of town today uh, ministering in Indiana. And my wife, I don't know what's going on, but my wife is also in Indiana at a wedding. I don't know what the deal is with Indiana. Seems like everybody's headed there. But uh, it is, uh, it's so good to see all of you. She, my wife will be back. She's, her plane is scheduled to land in about 30 minutes. So she'll be back for service tonight. We're going to have a great service. Thank you so much. And uh, it's going to be a tremendous, tremendous uh, day of worship in the Lord. Looking forward to what the Lord is uh, going to do in our service this evening. Amen. Feels good being in the house of the Lord today. And uh, for those of you that I have not met yet... My name is Rob McKee. I'm the senior pastor here at the Pentecostals. And we're just thrilled to have all of our guests here with us. Now, we're doing our best to social distance, but I want to tell you, it's painful because we are a handshaking, greeting, hugging church. 
And uh, we love connecting with all of our guests. And so I'll be glad when all this stuff is over. The good news is there are many within our congregation that have gotten sick and gotten better. So, you know, you don't have to worry about sickness anymore. And, uh, and so thank the Lord for, all, for that. Also, I've heard good news that there's possible a vaccine coming out this next month. And uh, I'm just praying we can, we can uh, get all of this stuff uh, over with as quickly as possible. Somebody say amen. 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 We serve a great God. and I'm so thankful for what the Lord is doing. Amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms 137. And we'll begin reading in verse number one. I want to quickly get into the word today and um, share with you something that the Lord has laid on my heart. And uh, I hope to not hold you very long. I I do want to uh, just share with you this this, uh, particular scripture. If it comes down to notes, I don't have a whole lot of notes today, not as much as I usually do. So that might be good news. Amen. Uh, Psalms 137 and verse number 1. Psalms 137 and verse number 1. All right, let's begin reading. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Everybody read it out loud with me. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive, the Babylonians, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And this is their response. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I'm going to give you the title here in just a moment. Uh, I, I, I'll, uh, I'll share it with you here in just a moment. But if you would, lay your Bibles down and let's pray together. Father, I thank you for all that have gathered in this house today. I thank you for your presence that we feel. God, for your goodness in our life. God, everything that you have done for us has been wonderful. And I thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. You're worthy of all the praise and the glory and the honor. And we lift up your name. Come on, lift up your voice right now. Let's praise him just for a moment. Father, we worship you. We love you today. God, you have been so good to us. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord. God, we praise your holy name. God, you're worthy of all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I do want to remind you about our service this evening, and uh, it begins at 6 o'clock. Lord willing, I'll be preaching in the service this evening. And um, see, for those of you that didn't know, I was sick, got over corona, so you don't have to worry about me. But um, I was sick and was out of service for almost three weeks. And so a lot of the folks, that I didn't get to preach for three weeks. So if you get tired of hearing me preach every service, you just got to understand. I got to get it out of my system. I got three weeks worth of sermons that, that I, I need to preach. Amen. I appreciate that. Thank you. <clears throat> Maya and Bailey were two young children alive in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, many years ago. Bailey, the boy, was just nine, and Maya was just seven years old. It was a tragic and terrible story, and um, this horrible, horrible uh, story is, is that this young seven-year-old girl was molested and raped by her mother's boyfriend. It's tragic. And he told and threatened the young Maya Uh, After this horrible act, he said, if you say anything to anybody, I will kill your brother. Maya's mother was an alcoholic, abusive, and um, not a good example. Her brother was the only one that she truly, really loved. And it frightened little Maya, and she determined that she wasn't going to say anything. Just a few days later, though, uh, Bailey noticed that she was being morose and, and uh, quiet, and so he asked her, 
Bailey, what happened? What's wrong? She told him, I can't tell you. And he, he pressed her, come on, you've got to tell me. And he said, she, little Maya said, if I tell you, the man said he would kill you. And Bailey responded with the shoulder squares. He said, what are you talking about? Nobody can kill me. The confidence of her older brother gave her the courage to tell her story. So Maya, she, uh, or Maya, she told her story. And, and in turn, Bailey went to his mother and told his mother what had happened. The police were called. The man was arrested. Young Maya was still very traumatized, but her mother offered no personal comfort and uh, just left her alone. But <clears throat> a few days later, late at night, there was a knock at the door, and, and uh, two policemen walked into the house, began talking to Maya's mother, and said, the man that raped your daughter has been found dead in his cell. He's apparently been kicked to death. Young Maya was already traumatized by the events, and, and yet when she heard this news, it, in some strange way, it devastated her. She didn't take it as good news. She took it as, as, as somehow, uh, in the, her fragile mind, that somehow her voice had caused the man's death. Trembling in that moment, that night, she decided, I will never speak again. My voice is too dangerous. I can hurt people with my voice. And from that moment, little Maya never spoke. She carried a small tablet with her. She tucked into her waistband. When someone would ask a question, she would write out her response. A year passed, and still Maya didn't speak. Two years Three years, four, five, seven years passed, and this, this young girl still refused to talk. Her mother couldn't raise her, and young Maya moved in with her grandmother, who, unlike her own mother, raised her with compassion. She embraced her. She told her, I believe in you. You're going to do great things. And yet still, Maya refused to talk. But her grandmother introduced her to a young English teacher who took a special interest in Maya. It's a beautiful story, the power of teachers who care. We have a lot of school teachers here in our, in our church. But this particular uh, English teacher uh, began uh, to carry little Maya to the local library. And there she would take books out and, and she uh, would give her a challenge and said, I'm coming back. Uh, here in, in a few hours, and I want you to have read everything from A to H in this library. And little Maya took it as a challenge. Someone, someone believed in her, and, and she became an avid reader. One day, this English teacher introduced little Maya uh, to a, a songbook. It was, it was filled with songs and poems and poetry, and little Maya, she seemed to really enjoy it. And on the paper, she scribbled out, can I read another one? And so the teacher gave her another book of songs and poetry. And, um, and little Maya wrote on her pad of paper, I love this. To her surprise, this English teacher who had grown so close to little Maya, had, uh, she challenged her and she said, no, you don't love this book. Again, Maya said, oh yes, I do love it. When she wrote it, that, that phrase out on her pad of paper, she didn't say it, but she wrote it out on the pad of paper and she held it up for the teacher and the teacher shoved her notepad out of the way and said, I don't want to see that. Little Maya was devastated and felt rejected by this person that she cared so much about and seemed to invest and she ran out of the library, ran all the way home, weeping and crying into her grandmother's arms. Her heart was crushed. She felt deep rejection. To her surprise, just a few minutes later, that teacher knocked on the door. And even standing in front of her grandmother, that teacher pointed her finger in the face of little Maya and she said, you don't love poetry. You don't love poetry. 
And she said, you don't love poetry until you can feel the sound of the poetry flow across your tongue and out your lips. You really can't know what love is all about. And little Maya listened as the teacher talked about the beauty of spoken poetry. She ran out of the house with the book in her hand, crying still. She made her way underneath the house, actually the front porch of the house. She climbed deep under the porch and with just the light of the trellis shining down underneath the house, she opened up the book and she began to read out loud. In that moment, little Maya realized that her voice brought more than just death. Her voice could bring beauty and life. This little girl, just a short time later, would sit down and write a poem of her own. It's called, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Ah, me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom is sore, when he beats his bars and would be free, it's not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the cage bird sings. Little Maya would go on to become a well-known, accomplished singer, an actress, and ultimately a poet. One of the greatest in American history. Maya Angelou was the first to speak at a presidential inauguration since Robert Frost spoke at the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. Today, I want to tell somebody that life has a way of stealing your voice and stealing your song. And I want to tell you that the devil is a liar. Amen. And I believe God wants to restore the song to somebody's heart again. Too often we face crises in our lives that steal our God-given voice. The voice that God gave us to bring life is still. Amen. And we end up going through life afraid to speak, afraid to say what we really feel. But I believe that God is in the restoration business. In our particular text, again, it's unclear who wrote this psalm. But uh, the, the children of Israel were lamenting their terrible condition. They had been taken captive by Babylon. And by the way, the book of Psalms has a variety of authors in it. It's, it's made up of, of many, many Psalms. David did not write them all. Probably he wrote about half of them. But some of the Psalms were written by Solomon. Others were written by uh, musicians that work for Solomon. And some are, um, it's unclear who wrote them, but because of the framing of the psalm itself, we know that most of the normal writers had already passed away. And this is one such psalm. This is after the captivity, the dividing of the kingdom and the captivity of Israel. And uh, Babylon has taken them captive. And they're sitting down by the rivers in Babylon and they're being ridiculed by their captors. And uh, uh, their captors had asked them, we want you to sing us a song of Jerusalem. Amen. This was not some request because it was a favorite song of the Babylonian taskmasters. They were mocking them. They were challenging them. Why don't you sing one of your songs that you used to sing in Babylon? The Bible says that they required of them mirth. It was a, it was a joke. It was an insult. And uh, they were challenging them. Note, their enemy was asking something from them that seemed impossible. But the response of the Israelites was, how can we sing a song of deliverance when we're in a strange land? Amen. It seems like the enemy was challenging. You sang songs when you were in your land of promise. You sang songs when you were your own people. But now you're going through things. You're going through some hardship, and we're in charge now. I dare you to sing a song. I dare you to worship God. What happened to all of your joy and all of your singing? You lost it somewhere. Why don't you go ahead and sing a song now, Israel? Amen. You sang songs when times were good, but now that you've lost a battle, now that you're facing trial and tribulation, I just want to know, can you still sing a song of deliverance? 
even when you're facing captivity? Can you sing a song about healing when you're sick in your body? Can you sing a song about the goodness of the Lord when like Job, you look to the left and the right and you can't find God anywhere? I wonder, can you still sing songs of of Zion when you're facing great trial? Amen. Uh, You see, the enemy seems to challenge our worship because he knows the power of our worship. I won't go back and preach last week's message, but there's something powerful about singing songs of worship to God when we're facing trial. It elevates the singer. It elevates the worshiper above every trial that you're facing. When you can sing a song in your prison house, you become the master of the prison. Amen. When you let the enemy know it doesn't matter what I'm going through. God is still good. Amen. God is still a deliverer. God still, he knows the path I take. Amen. I, I, I don't like to dwell on negative images. One of the, the great tragedies and travesties of our world's history was the Holocaust. And, and Houston has a tremendous Holocaust museum. One of the the images that I saw, and, and, and I've, I've only been to these museums a few times because it really messes me up. And, and, but I remember going through it as a young man and, and seeing all of the, the horrible things done to people, such evil, uh, just terrible, terrible things. And, but there was one picture in particular that impacted me, and I stood before it and I wept. And, and, uh, and the picture was of a long trench with Nazi uh, soldiers standing with their rifles, and, and uh, there were dead bodies of people that they were executing. They apparently had just gone down the line and were, and were executing uh, Jewish prisoner after Jewish prisoner. It was a tragic thing, and this, this frozen moment in time pictures a man who was obviously uh, had been starved and he was he was standing there with with rags and uh, and all of the soldiers around him were laughing but the man's mouth was open his head was thrown back and uh, and the, the the record says that in that moment right before his death he was singing a song of worship to the Lord amen there's something that if infuriates the enemy Enemy, that the enemy does not understand. Hey Amen. It, it was the challenge that Satan had with Job. He thought that the only reason why Job was not uh, cursing God, the only reason that he was praising God, was that he was surrounded by blessings. God, you have blessed him so much, but if you take away the blessings, he's, he's going to curse you. It'll change what he says. It'll change what he does. But to his surprise, when God allowed the enemy to remove all of the blessings, and and took everything from him, Job would still lift up his hands and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. How did Job get through his trial? He never lost his praise. He never lost his song of worship. And I just want to stir up a little worship in this place. It's not a complicated sermon today. I just want to remind the church, amen, we need to get our song back. We've been through some things. The the enemy's tried to discourage us, but it's time we stirred up our worship one more time. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Amen. It's possible that the church can become so reactive to spoken word that we wait on somebody to say something that we agree with before we open our mouth and say, praise God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I want to remind you, I want to take you back to the early days of your salvation experience. Amen. Well, let me just share mine because that's the one, the story that I know. I remember early on, guys, I was about your age when God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I I, I didn't have anybody around me encouraging me, telling me, man, you could make it. I didn't know I was going to be a preacher. I I, I just wanted, I was, I just wanted to please God and do something for God with my life. I, I, I had another path. 
path I was moving on. And, and I remember I sat on the front row every day. Nobody had to tell me to sit on the front row. I sat there every day. I remember in the, in the middle of the heat of the day, well, even before I became a preacher, for, before God called me to preach, I would sit out in my car on a break. And in, in, in Texas summer without air conditioning, that's, that's, that's a sacrifice. But I would sit in my car because I wanted to be alone. And I would read my Bible. And I would pray the scriptures because I was in love with the Lord. But when I came to the house of the Lord, when I came to church, the preacher did not have to stir me up. Nobody had to cheerlead me. Amen. My pastor even joked about it. He said, you're the first one in the altar. Even if I was preaching about the, the 12 virtues of a righteous woman, you'd be the first in the altar. Amen. He took it. Uh, he, he was trying to, to, to just, you know, get at me a little bit. But I took it as a compliment because every time I come to the house of the Lord, it doesn't matter if my favorite preacher's preaching, my favorite singer is singing, God is still worthy of all the praise. I, I want to get a breakthrough every service. Hallelujah. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. You know who's going to be filled today? It's not the people that come satisfied and sit back quietly watching a show but it's the people that are hungry for God and will worship in spite of what happens no matter what is said no matter what is done they're going to get something from the Lord is that you today? Are you, are you in the house of God hungry for the touch of God? I told you it's not a complicated message. I'm trying to stir up our hunger. Amen. I don't know all of those and if, uh, all the troubles that you've faced in the midst of all of this corona mess. I know many have, have, have suffered both physically and loss of loved ones. Some have, have endured loss of jobs. You're, you're dealing with a lot of emotions. Some are going through crisis in their family. You're dealing with a lot of stuff. But I want to tell you, that the best response to trial, the best response to trouble will always be worship. Not quiet devotion of heart, but verbal worship to the Lord. Active worship to the Lord. I love you, Lord. God, you have been so good to me. Lord, I praise you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for what you brought me through. Hallelujah. Pastor, you, you having a moment, the Holy Ghost. No, I don't feel anything right now. It's not about how I feel. It's about what he's worthy of. Amen. God is worthy of praise. Both in the books of uh, the Gospels of Matthew and again in Luke. We're told the story of the, of the centurion leader who comes to the Lord. Talking about his servant who is sick at home. And the Lord says, I will come and I'll heal. And he said, no, no, no. I'm not worthy to come under your roof. And, and, or you're not worthy to, that, that, or I'm not worthy that you would come under my roof. But if you will just speak the word, just speak the word, then my servant would be healed. Amen. Jesus, the Bible says, based on what you said, great is thy faith. Because of what you have said, I will heal. Go. Again, he makes this a similar statement with the, uh, the woman whose daughter is grievously vexed of the devil. And you know how that, that the Lord contended with her, it seems. And, and he talks to her and challenges her and says, you know, the, the, it's, it's not me to give the children's bread to the dogs. And by the way, it may seem cruel, but Jesus, amen, he would have never healed her unless he in, in, intended to heal her. Amen. Sometimes the Lord will provoke you. Uh, it's been a while since I preached about it, but sometimes the Lord will, will provoke you a little bit because he knows that's what you need to hear. Amen. And so the Lord provokes her a little bit, and she made the statement that brought about a miracle. Just one statement. Amen. She said, but Lord, even the, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Again, Jesus makes reference because of what you have said. Amen. I will do it. There is power in what you say. There's power in your words. Too often we feel like I've got to have victory in my heart. No, you've got to have victory in your mouth. You need to open up your mouth and just tell the Lord, God, you have been good to me. God, I thank you for the joy. I don't have joy, but if I thank you for it enough, I will have joy. God, you're worthy of the praise. 
Do you feel it? No, I don't feel it. But if I will lift him up, I know that I'm going to feel it after a while. We have become situational praisers, situational singers. And the enemy challenges us. Can you sing your song of joy now? Amen. The answer that Israel gave was, listen, we have hung our harps on the willows. We've given up. We just settled. We're waiting to see a change in our situation before we sing again. We can only sing of God's goodness in good times, times of plenty, times of joy. The truth was that even in the good times, Israel had an issue with praise. They would praise God when they got delivered. Amen. But after they had been delivered, their, their praise was temporary. They never learned to praise God in spite of their circumstance. They would praise God for a while, and then they would forget about the Lord and begin to worship the gods of the heathens in their land. God would have to allow them to go through a trial or situation or captivity. They would cry out to the Lord in desperation. He would send in a deliverer. Over 20 times they went through that cycle. Trouble, deliverance, and then praise, then forget God, back to trouble, and then deliverance, and then praise. God was, God was trying to pull out of them a consistency, and that's, that's really what I wanted to challenge the church with today. So we've got to be consistent in our worship. Amen. There's something powerful about opening up your mouth and with a loud voice praising the Lord. People that don't understand it, I, I just want, want you to understand, there, there is power in speaking it out loud. Even psychologists will tell you that if you're having a conversation with your spouse, the last thing that you need to do is have a conversation from a different room. Go to the same room. They'll tell you this. Go to the same room and talk to them. And the reason why they don't want you to have a conversation from another room is that you will raise your voice. And it might be something benign. It might be a simple task. Did you get the clothes out of the dryer? What? Did you get the clothes out of the dryer? There's conviction in this room right now. Some <laughs> husbands realized, uh-oh, I forgot. I just felt it and got real tight all of a sudden. But there's something about raising your voice, they say over benign subjects that will quickly devolve into an argument. Something about lifting up a loud voice that engages your emotions and your feelings and suddenly, you, even though you weren't mad, now you're having a screaming argument and you're mad and you're angry simply because you raised your voice. Perhaps that's why the psalmist David said we ought to praise God with a loud voice. Maybe that's why John the Revelator, when he looked into heaven, he heard a sound around the throne of people praising God. And he said it sounded like the voice of many waters. Because when you praise God with everything you've got, you're going to make some noise. It engages your spirit. It engages your mind. How long has it been since from the top of your lungs you cried out to the Lord and said, God, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to challenge you today. Come on, take just a few moments. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands to the Lord. And with a loud voice, cry out to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise you, God. God, you're wonderful. God, you're great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost here today. God bless you. you may be seated. To put this particular psalm in its proper context, you actually have to read the writings of the prophet Ezekiel, who has taken captivity at the same time. Ezekiel 1 and verse number 3. Uh, I want to use this as, as an example. It was in the middle of the captives that Ezekiel saw a vision uh, of the work of God. 
And while Israel was wandering in its self-pity and defeat, God was speaking to the preacher and giving him a word of direction for the people. I won't go into the whole vision that Ezekiel has. But while some are sitting there and weeping and, and refusing to sing, Ezekiel is having a vision from the Lord. Same time frame, same place. And, and he sees these four beasts. He sees in this, this vision, he sees the Lord as the wheel in the midst of a wheel. And he heard a, a voice. Now, in this moment of all this vision, and, and there's a lot of typology and shadows in it, and we won't go into it all, but, but ultimately what he sees is the power and the dominion of God in the middle of this moment. And um, then he hears a voice, a voice that was rebuking the children of Israel for their, their behavior. And he tells Ezekiel, listen, Ezekiel, you have got to go warn Israel. You've got to open up your mouth and speak. And then in Ezekiel 2, hopefully you've got this scripture, Ezekiel 2 and verse number 5. He says, and, and whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they, are, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a, hath been a prophet among them. In other words, Ezekiel, I'm sending you forth for one purpose, for a testimony. When you open up your mouth and begin to speak about the good things of God, they may not listen to you. They may ignore everything that you say. People may look at you like you, you fell off a, I don't know if there's a turnip truck, but I hear people are falling off of them. I, that people are going to look at you like you're crazy. But ultimately, what I want is I want them to know when the, when the dust settles and the sun sets, I want them to know that there was a man of God among them. Among all of the whining and the complaining and the depression, I want them to know that you were there, Ezekiel. So I want you to open up your mouth and make some noise. Amen. Can I tell somebody this morning, there are times that church gets a little too quiet. We wait on situations to change and life to adjust, and we surrender our voice. But I want to challenge somebody. When you come into the house of the Lord, people may look down on you because you're worshiping but you need to let everybody know I'm here and I am a worshiper they will never come to church and look at me and wonder what God has done for me if God's blessed me I came to praise everybody's going to know I don't know what God's done for that person but God has been good hallelujah amen God's been good to them God has blessed them. Amen. I praise. Psalms 149. Amen. We're commanded to praise the Lord and, and, and to sing aloud upon our beds. Amen. One of the, the things that we often miss in our praise, in Psalms 150, we're told that we ought to praise him for his mighty acts. Amen. Praise him for his mighty acts. Anybody got any mighty acts they could praise the Lord for? Amen. In other words, people ought to be able to look at our life and our praise is a testimony to the goodness of the Lord. So if God has not done any mighty acts in your life, then you have a right to just sit there. But if God has blessed you when you didn't deserve it, if God has been good to you when you thought all hope was, was gone, if God has protected you when you were helpless, amen, our praise ought to be a testimony. God has been good. And everybody around us ought to look at us and say, hey, I don't know what God's done, but God has been good. Come on, somebody, why don't you just take a moment and praise God according to his excellent greatness in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad some of you are clapping, but you need to open up your mouth and praise him too. Amen. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Hallelujah. God, you've been good. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. 
so you really can't experience God. You really can't appreciate the beauty of God until you feel the sound of your praise coming across your tongue and out your lips. When you begin to worship the Lord, you are ushered into a new appreciation of who God is. Amen. And so in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, we're, said, we're told, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's the will of God that we are worshipers. Music, musicians, please come. Ephesians uh, is a beautiful uh, epistle written by the Apostle Paul. It is a personal uh, epistle. Um, and, and so often we can read through these and, and not fully appreciate uh, the subject matter that, that we're, we're covering. And, and, and I just want to say that uh, Ephesians, in, uh, Ephesians 1, it begins in a very unique way. And uh, according to uh, most commentaries and, and uh, uh, theologians, they say that Ephesians 1 is written much like the Old Testament uh, Proverbs, or um, like the Old Testament, not Proverbs, but Psalms. It's actually written more like a song than it is directive epistle. And the Apostle Paul, it begins, and, and this is why, in, in uh, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the, uh, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Talk about heavenly places. Amen. Song of praise, Paul is right. Verse number six, he makes a statement to the praise and the glory of his grace. Verse, verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Verse number 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance and of the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Again, it's a psalm of praise goes all the way through the first part of this epistle, all the way down to verse number 14. It's all about praise. And, and as, as, as you're reading through this, over 2,000 years later, it's so easy to think that the Apostle Paul is, is writing about all this in some kind of a church service. But Paul is writing this psalm of praise about sitting in heavenly places. God has made us to sit in heaven. You know where he's sitting? in a Roman prison filled with disease, beaten, ridiculed, waiting on his, edu uh, his, his execution, not knowing whether or not he would escape. But he's still, still saying, God is so good. God has made us to sit in heavenly places. Amen. God is good. How many believe that? God is a healer. How many believe that? God is merciful. How, how many believe that? Anybody here that believes that? I want to tell you, you can be in agreement, but you really don't believe it until you speak it yourself. And you let the Lord know, God, I'm so glad you're a healer. God, I'm so thankful that you are a keeper. Some are, are living in fear over a disease that they can't see. Every day you need to lift up your voice and say, God, I'm glad that you're the healer of these bodies. I'm glad that you're in charge of everything. You're worried about your finances. God, I, I, I'm so thankful that you are the God that prospers. You're the God that provides. You are my Jehovah Jireh. John 4 and, and 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Psalms 95 and 1. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise unto the rock of our salvation. John 4 and 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hebrews 13 and 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, unto him without the gate, bearing his reproach. Well, hang on. I, 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 if, if life is so bad outside the gate, I want to stay within the gate. And yet, we are called to step outside of that at times. We're called to step outside a life of comfort like we've been going through for the last several months. And the reason for it is interesting. Verse 14, it says, 
For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice to praise God. Praise to God continually. Even though I'm outside the gate, yes, keep praising God. Even though I'm going through my personal Calvary, yes, keep praising God. That is the fruit of our lips. It's not just about clapping. Amen. We're not, we're not just in it for the applause. Oh, good thought, preacher. This is not a response to the preaching. It's a response to God. I don't deserve the praise. God deserves the praise. So we... But when we open up our mouth and we begin to offer praise to the Lord, it changes the direction of all our behavior. Jesus suffered outside of the gate, it said, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood to save others. That's why he suffered outside the gate. Sometimes the trouble that we go through is not about us. Sometimes the suffering that we face is not about us. But God will send us through suffering like he did with Job so that others could be blessed by our appropriate response to trouble. It's not about us. It's about saving somebody else. And then if you needed to be reminded, we have no continuing city. This world is not our home. If we suffered for 70 plus years or however long God gives us here on earth, if we suffered every moment of it, And yet we're faithful to God and worshipers in covenant with the Lord. Heaven will be worth it. Amen. I I give you this and and, and I'll, I'll be finished. Revelation 14. We flip time ahead. We see the Lord is in the midst of what many would call uh, the the, the end of all things. There's a lot of debate about when this actually happens, but it's, it's further along in the process following the rapture. The Bible says, I heard a great voice from heaven, Revelation 14 and 2, as the voice of many waters is the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping, with their harps. Hmm, it's interesting. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders, that no man could learn that song. But the 140 and, 40, uh, uh, and 44,000 which were redeemed from the earth. This is dealing with the Jewish nation. And, and these were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. And these were they which followed the Lamb. Whithersoever, whithersoever he goeth, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne. This is, and then suddenly there is a transition that ties it into Psalms 137. I, I, I'd never seen this before, but the Lord just showed me this. This, of course, the harpers harping, it's dealing with, with Psalms 137 and singing a new song. But then it ties it all together. There's, there, there's no doubt that there is a connection because there's an angel that flies from the midst of heaven and he says with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that hath made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And another angel follows and said, Babylon has fallen. <laughs> Remember Babylon? Your excuse for not worshiping, your excuse for hanging your harp on the willows. Amen. Now it's fallen. But note the people that are saved, those that make it, are those that keep on harping. Those that keep on singing. And they keep singing and they keep singing. Babylon rules and Babylon mocks us, but we keep on singing and we keep on praising God. Amen. I'm not going to lose my witness, my testimony. Why? Because this world is not my home. I'm headed somewhere. Because there's going to be a moment while I'm singing. There's going to be a moment while I'm harping. Amen. That There's going to be an angel that comes and says, remember those people that caused you so much trouble? Remember those problems that were surrounding you and you wondered if you could worship? I got good news for you. Babylon has fallen. 
there's going to come a day when coronavirus is gone. There's going to come a moment when all tears are wiped away. There will be a moment when all the things that you're consumed with that are about to bury you right now, they'll all be resolved, healed, delivered from every last one of them. And in that moment, God is looking for people that have not lost their worship. Can we stand together? It may seem like Babylon is winning, but don't stop singing. Don't stop worshiping. Keep playing your harp. The people that overcome and make it to heaven will make it with praise in their lips. Amen. I, I, I realize this message this morning is simple, but there's something powerful about people who worship. I've learned that people who worship, you don't have to worry about discouraging them. Amen. They're, they're never discouraged. People that, that are true worshipers seem to always have victory. There's something about it. People that worship have a different attitude from other folks. There's something about worship that elevates the worshiper, takes them from a place of trouble to a place of godly vision and promise, a place of faith. When I worship God, my head is lifted up above my enemies, David said. Something about praise that's lifting me up. Something about worship that elevates me above this plane of trouble that I'm in right now. And so today, I want to do something very simple in closing. I want you to forget about everybody else around you with every eye closed. I want you to forget about your neighbor, your family, everyone around you. I want you to raise your hands as high as you can as a sign of surrender to the Lord. And for just a few moments, I want you to open up your mouth and give God the praise that he's worthy of. Hallelujah. Whatever trial you're facing, he is the God of that too. Whatever you're going through, he's the master of that. Come on, praise him for it right now. You're going to feel the presence of the Lord begin to descend in your life right now. Some of you are already feeling the Holy Ghost right where you're standing. That's all it took was just a voice. A praise hallelujah come on just lift up your voice hallelujah I love you Jesus God you're the God of my finances you're the God of my health hallelujah hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah come on lift up your voice that's it that's it God let the Lord encourage you Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Just praise him. If you want to step out in the aisle and make your way to the front, you can. Just remember social distancing. Hey, Amen. Let's just praise him. Hallelujah. If you're here and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if, you, if you've never been baptized in water in the name of Jesus, I encourage you. Take advantage of this moment. You can get in covenant with the Lord today. All you got to do is step forward until one of our ministers, God will fill you with his spirit today. Oh, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. That's it. Come on, let the tears flow. Come on, let it come from your heart right now. Come on, don't be weary and well doing. Keep worshiping until you feel a change. Keep praising. I love you, Jesus. Make it personal. You and the Lord right now. No matter what your condition, no matter what you've been through this week, God can make everything all right. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. You're worthy. We give you all the praise. God, you've been so good. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. That's it, just you and the Lord right now. That's all right, right? Come on, don't be weary and well doing. Hallelujah, I praise you, Father. I love you, Lord. God, you've been so good to us. Come on, thank him. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth for all generations. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings.
Lord's now has ordained strength because of my enemies. Now I'm going to steal the enemy of the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over all the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl, the air, and the fish of the sea. What sort of passeth through the paths of the sea? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Oh, we give you all the praise, all the praise, all the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you reach out and make contact with your spouse if you're standing next to someone in your household. Begin to worship with them. Connect with somebody else and just worship with them. We lift our hands. Oh, yes, we do. Here in your presence. Oh, we worship you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Jesus, come on, there's power and praise. There's power and praise. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Praise is the vehicle that brings you into his presence. Praise him. Even if you don't feel it, praise him. Jesus made his way to Samaria. There's no other reason he went except to interact with a woman, not the best reputation. She came to draw out water out of a well. When Jesus asked her for water from the well, it began a discussion on worship and praise. And Jesus made a statement that I, I really feel like it was a personal statement for that woman. He said that the Father seeketh such to worship Him. In other words, God's looking for people to worship Him. He's looking for folks to worship Him. And the great news for that woman was it doesn't matter what your reputation is. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what your history is. What I really want is just somebody that's going to worship me. Amen. The truth is, none of us deserve to be here today. Not one of us. Every one of us are flawed, failures. Every one of us have issues. Look at somebody beside you and tell them, you got some issues. Everybody's got some issues. Amen. We all have problems. None of us deserve the goodness of the Lord. On your best day, you still don't deserve what God has done. But in spite of everything you've done, God will set it all aside because he's so hungry for our worship and praise. He's looking for worshipers. Not worried about the past. I'm looking for worshipers. Not worried about your history. I'm just looking for worshipers. That's what makes me want to worship him. Because I know had it not been for the grace of God, I wouldn't even be here today. Amen. Amen. I, I know some of you look at other folks in the church and you feel condemnation because you feel like, well, nobody knows what I've done. Nobody knows my full story. 
the truth is, everybody's got skeletons in their closet. You don't want to know anybody's testimony in full. <laughs> you, when we testify, we testify about some stuff, but you, you don't want to, there's other stuff. We don't get up and testify about, can I get an amen, just kind of nod like I'm talking about somebody else? Amen. But God has brought us together in this place, and he's just looking for worshipers. I want the Lord to know he's found one right here. I know it's been a long time since I said it, but if God should tarry in one day, they plant me in the ground. I, I realize I may not be the greatest preacher, the greatest leader. That's not really what I'm, I want to be good at both, but uh, I want them somewhere, somewhere on my gravestone to, to etch in that stone. Here lies the greatest worshiper that I ever knew. Amen. He's worthy of the praise. Come on, lift your hands one more time and just tell him, God, I love you. Thank you for your blessings. I'm going to be a worshiper, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for your blessings in our life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. To all of our guests that are here today, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Asking Brother Harris to come. He's one of our uh, senior staff ministers. I want him to come. And he's going to pray a prayer of dismissal. And once he's finished praying, you can consider yourself dismissed. I ask that you remember our service this evening. And uh, God's going to meet with us. We had a powerful, powerful Sunday night last Sunday night. So I believe God's going to do it again. My wife will be back. And uh, so we're going to have a great service. Brother Harris, would you come and pray? What an incredible message today. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the word of the Lord? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of the Lord today that you fed us from your throne room of heaven. Thank you, God. Help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word and apply it to our souls and go forth giving you praise and glory in the beautiful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Remember tonight, 530 prayer, 6 p.m. church. We're going to have a great time tonight. Invite someone to come and be with you.
Let's go.